Okay, this is a little bit from the book. Wonder is an interesting phenomenon because it's that moment when all of our narratives and stories about life disappear in the rapturous experience of actually being here, actually being alive, being present with the glorious now, like when you get really close to some street musicians playing a song, or when you pet a horse, or when you see a solar eclipse. Wonder is most accessible in new situations because we don't have a narrative about what's happening. And he says earlier, human beings are narrative-making machines. Our five senses are taking in way more information about than we can ever possibly know or imagine, and our brains are synthesizing all of this information into simple narratives. Narratives like, this is a safe road I'm drive driven down before. This is my friend Dave, whom I went to college with. I'm all alone in the universe. They can have a range of meanings, but they're part of our biological makeup for surviving in the world. And then he says, wonder is most accessible in new situations because we don't have a narrative about what's happening yet. Have you ever traveled overseas? You may know the experience of getting off the train in a city you've never visited before, overwhelmed by the beautiful architecture and sights and sounds all around you and thinking, this is the most beautiful city I've ever seen. Then three days later, you say, I'm so bored as you board the train to the next city. What happened? Did the city change? No, you did. You got familiar with everything and the wonder went away. What happens when we substitute the mechanics for the essence is that the wonder can go away. I'm not saying we have to start over every time to keep things interesting. It's helpful to find familiar rituals and practices that keep us grounded, but maybe what's happened to our celebration of Christmas is we've gotten so familiar with certain seasonal mechanics that we've begun to lose the wonder of the essence. Where is Jesus? If you've read the scriptural account, you know that after his death on a cross and his burial, he resurrects out of the grave three days later, Easter. He appears for a while in some mysterious ways to a handful of people. Then, on a mountaintop with his friends, he gives them a final commission and lifts into the clouds and ascends to heaven. So, I guess he's in heaven, and I'm not going to pretend I fully understand what that means. Okay, right? But I can't point to it on a map. Is it in the sky? Is it behind Jupiter, another dimension? If you ask a child in Sunday school where Jesus is, they will point to their heart, and that's actually not a bad place to point not that he's put his bed in your aortic valve, but in some mysterious way, the center of our being has always been the doorway to connecting with God. Jesus once said to his disciples that it would be better for us if he left because he would give us the spirit that will always connect us with the divine maker of all things. Connection with the divine has evolved over time from a burning bush, a tent, a temple, a first century Jewish carpenter, and now the mysterious hidden portal within you. But it was the fireproof leaves of the bush, or the fabric of the tent, or the stone of the temple that connected you with God? Or was it just the mechanics that helped you get to the essence? Where is Jesus now on his birthday? I honestly want to know. This was actually the scariest question to me a few years ago as I was examining the Christmas, Christmas, Come on, Paige Turner, celebration. I grew up with, I was afraid that all I would find was a love for the mechanics, but no real experience with the essence of Jesus. I wanted to have an honest advent, one that actually prepared me for the coming of the hope of the world, because I, and I believe we, need that hope more than ever. This book is an exploration of finding the God with us coming into our midst now. What I believe is that the essence of the birthday boy is hiding out in the mechanics of this life, the one you're living presently, that yes, we can look to candles, songs, and pageantry to help us connect to the divine, but we can also look to pregnancy, biology, history, and mystery as sacred meaning places with the incarnational Christ. Back when I started making these illustrations, I began to share these images and meditations on Instagram and Facebook. What he says was that he got a lot of response from women. Christian majority of Christian imagery has been created by men, and it's not too much to project that those men felt the reality of birth must be sanitized in our cultural celebration of Christmas. I mean, I get it. A birth is a roller coaster ride of biological wonder that is not for the faint of heart. 
but I do not think this sanitization has added another painful layer to the experience that women can have in Western religion, and we need to address it and push against it. Female biology has been stigmatized by mainstream religion far too long as an avenue for wayward lusts, a means of bloody uncleanliness, or a subservient incarnation to those who don't have a uterus. And yet right there in the text is the celebration of a woman's biology as a means in which the divine incepted grew and emerged into this world that loves so much. If you've ever witnessed a birth, you know that every birth is a holy experience. So this is interesting because, because what he says down here now, what he's going to say about learning and knowledge is something that I got out of this dream that I had last night. So that's kind of like one of those synchro mystical events, which is this. It's a celebration of divine participation through the body of a woman. It has been with great humility and reverence that I created imagery depicting the female body in moments of pregnant journeying. I cannot fully understand what it's like to be in a body that is growing a baby. I asked my wife all the time what it felt like to have someone kicking around in there, but no words can ever fully translate the embodied experience. All I can is share my witness to such wonderful happenings and my artistic interpretation of those experiences. What is he saying is that he cannot know that. He just can witness somebody else who knows that. And that's what I, I got out of this dream last night. But this book offers 25 word and image meditation. But he says something here. We are often use words as a way to connect with ideas, but I think it's important to offer imagery as well. My suggestion is to spend a minute with each image. Let it excavate you. A great question when it comes to art is, what does this mean? An even better question is, what is this pulling out of me? Art has that glorious excavating quality, so don't miss out. Excavating. Let me also note that I play with spiritual language in this book. When we talk about Jesus, we talk about a man, so I naturally refer to him as him. But with God or the Spirit, I may use a non-gendering reference such as it or they. I do this on purpose to pull us into the greater mystery of the divine that demands us to evaluate how we speak of it and remove us from assumptions of divine gender. It also is to remove any unnecessary barriers that could get in the way of readers who are trying to find themselves in this story that is for everyone. It is not a diminishing choice, but rather an enlarging invitation I offer to you. My hope is this book awakens the wonder of God with us in you by contemplating how it happened back then and also here and actually right now. I hope it can be a visual and lyrical companion as we enter into this season of anticipation waiting for the coming. Hope we deeply long for, and may it be the tasty cake at the birthday party that is still happening today just as it did 2,000 years ago. And I love that this came in August. To think about, start thinking about Christmas right now. And then here's the first image, which is Annunciation, so I have to share this with you. And it's Luke 1, 28. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Confused and disturbed. So here what we have here now is angel comes. She gets disturbed. Not like, oh, wow, this is cool. Here's an angel. You know, oh, I'm calling in the radio show. I had an experience with an angel. She gets confused and disturbed. So here's the image. Thank you, Scott Erickson.